Okay, thanks Andy. That's a good backdrop for what we're looking at in terms of the economy right now. And when we look at leadership in terms of Virginia's economy, basically we are already a leader. And we see that in the data. I'm going to show you some of this uh, data um, in terms of employment growth. We're typically growing faster than the U.S. In terms of the unemployment rate, we're typically at least one or two percentage points below the U.S. And that's because of our highly educated population. Our education level, uh, in terms of the percentage who have bachelor's degree, are about uh, number seven in terms of the country. But we have some challenges, and that is not all regions in Virginia are thriving. And so we'll take a look at that, and in terms of looking at the root cause of that, what I'm going to try to show you is that it's really the workforce and the occupations underpinning the industries that is the region's key to future success. And as we look at that, then it becomes very important that uh, train training and curriculum is business relevant. That is, that we're training kids to go into occupations that are in demand, that we're not adding, for example, more courses in forensic science just because kids like to watch it on TV and thinks that's, that's what they want to do. When they finish, they find there is no job out there, so, or not as many jobs as they had expected given all the competition. So job seekers then need to have the information to know what will be in demand in the future. So beginning first with Virginia's leadership, it's evident in the numbers. Here's the unemployment rate. The gray shaded areas are recessions. And you could see that our unemployment rate is typically a full two percentage points less than the nation overall. And that's, again, because of the highly educated population that we have. Andy showed you some numbers that the higher level of a degree that you have, the lower the unemployment rate of those individuals in addition to the higher income. When we look at employment, now the orange line is Virginia, percent change from a year ago, and the gray shaded area is the U.S. You see that typically we're growing faster than the U.S. or we're at the U.S. average. If you look at the last recession, which is shown, um, trying to highlight it here, shown here, you can see that we did not decline as much as the U.S. overall during the recession. In the previous recession, it was not as deep in Virginia as it was in the U.S. overall. And then when we look to the future, in terms of an expected growth rate, um, here I'm showing you the major sectors in terms of the economy and their employment in the first column, their average wages in the second column. And then in the very last column, I'm showing you a forecast, um, the expected job growth um, over the next 10 years for each of those industries. And at the bottom, highlighted in yellow, 1.7% uh, growth rate expected for Virginia overall over the next 10 years. That's an annual average. In the U.S., the growth rate is about 1.4%. So even as we look forward, we're expected to see um, Virginia maintain its edge in terms of leadership and growth. And here I'm highlighting for you just two um, major sectors that are growing um, at a very fast pace, 3.1% per year expected over the next 10 years. Uh, professional science and technology services, they pay a very high wage, around 96000 and you can see below that in blue, healthcare also expected to grow 3.1% a year. So we're going to need a lot of um, kids to be taking healthcare, to be taking um, classes in areas that would be used in professional, scientific, and technical services. And then also on this slide, what I'd like to point out to you is that over the next 10 years, we're expecting to see 646,000 new net growth in our economy in terms of jobs. However, this number right before it, 866,000, is what we're expecting to see because of retirement. That is, we're going to need 800,000 more people coming into our workforce just because of the number of people retiring or going into different occupations. In terms of higher education, um, you can see here Virginia in red, and we're the seventh highly educated state in terms of the percentage with a BS degree or higher. And also, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you uh, annual average wages in those states, percent with uh, BS degree is the horizontal axis. And it's no surprise that as you have a higher percentage of people uh, with a BS degree that there are higher wages in those states. Notice the District of Columbia is sort of an outlier there um, with over 80,000 average. I won't go into detail on that, but uh, your murmuring is, is, is thinking the same things that uh, have gone through my head. Um, Maryland is in purple, 
Um, notice that Maryland has a little bit of a more highly educated population than we do. And I highlighted North Carolina in green, much less um, educated and also the wage is lower. Given the uh, triangle down there, you would expect it to be higher, but it's traditionally been a manufacturing, um, a high manufacturing uh, state, and so that's why the wages are held down a bit. So now, now going to the challenges that we face, and there are huge challenges that you're going to see on these next few slides in that not all regions in Virginia are thriving. When we look at Northern Virginia versus the rest of the state, you've probably heard it said that Northern Virginia is the driver of the state. When we look at it over time, Northern Virginia produces about 40% of the jobs, uh, the due jobs that we see in the state on an annual average basis. On this chart, you're now seeing Northern Virginia in red and the rest of the state in green. And we're only going back to 2000, and over this period, 216,000 new jobs were created, or net new jobs. 212 of them came from Northern Virginia. So Northern Virginia over the past decade has really been the driver of growth. And you can notice during the recession that Northern Virginia's job loss was nearly, not nearly as great as it was in the state overall. So when we look at Northern Virginia, and up in the upper right-hand corner you see a little map with uh, the Northern Virginia area highlighted, um, we look at clusters of industries, and that gives us an idea of why it's growing and why some regions are, are not growing. So on this chart, a little explanation first. The bottom scale shows you a projected uh, growth rate for employment. And notice it's all positive. It's not going to be all positive on the next slide that I show you. And here's the annual average income. Each one of these circles represents a cluster of industries. And if it's larger than 1.25, which is this key here, then you're set to have a competitive advantage. And that is other firms will co-locate in the area because of the training providers there, because of the buyer suppliers. And notice what stands out here. Professional services is twice as concentrated in Northern Virginia as in the rest of the country. So, sorry about that. Um, that's one of the strongest competitive advantages uh, that uh, Northern Virginia has. One of the issues, however, and Senator Warner alluded to this, is that we have the Budget Control Act of 2011 that was passed. This is law. This is going to happen. Um, on January 1st, we're going to see some huge increases in taxes and some huge cuts in federal spending. Um, and with those cuts in federal spending, the Congressional Budget Office, that's the CBO, has done a study. It just came out in May. And they said it's likely, this thing that we're calling the fiscal cliff, they say it's likely that the nation will be in recession in the first and second quarter of next year. Just because of these changes in policy that are law now, so unless someone changes them, unless Congress changes them between now and uh, February 1st or January 1st, it's likely that our country will be in recession for the two um, first quarters of the year. And given that um, Virginia receives more federal contract awards than any other state in the nation over this past year, uh, the previous year, uh, you would expect that that would have an impact on Virginia, although we don't have the details of how the cuts will occur. We just know that there will be X, X amount cut from federal spending. Um, so it's, there's no way to know with certainty how that would affect um, the state overall. But much of that spending from, federal, um, from the federal um, contracts shows up in the professional business services area, which is this yellow um, circle in the upper right hand that pays a wage that's up around 90000 or so. When we look at the metropolitan areas versus the rural areas, uh, the rural areas are now in red. Uh, you can see that actually since 2000, there's been a net loss of 70,000 jobs in the rural areas. And again, here you can see that even sometimes when the economy is growing, that rural areas are actually seeing a decline in employment. So the rural areas have not benefited um, like the urban areas during the past um, growth period. Now I'm going to highlight West Piedmont region to you, which is the Martinsville, Danville area, to give you a contrast. Um, and there are other areas around the state uh, where the numbers would be similar. But here you're looking at total employment going all the way back to 1991. And notice that the, basically since the uh, late 90s, the West Piedmont area has been in decline. Uh, here you can see they're off about 20,000 jobs over that period. 
And now here, um, in the upper right-hand corner is a map again. The green shaded area is the West Piedmont area. And here you're seeing the uh, clusters for that area. And now notice that over the next 10 years, we have quite a few clusters of industries that are expected to shed jobs in the West Piedmont area, in contrast to Northern Virginia, where there was gains in all the sectors. Notice, too, that the largest circles that we're looking at, wood and paper, chemical, and still textiles, are declining. The largest circles are their competitive advantages, and their, their competitive advantages are basically in the wrong industries. They're in industries that are in declining, as opposed to professional service. Remember that on the chart of Northern Virginia was much larger, and of course the wages were much larger. So when I look at this um, chart, it, it gives me a sense that this region is still has some hard times ahead of it. And here we're just looking at the manufacturing sector now, where they're off 25,000 jobs since 1991. And the issue here is that when we continue to lose jobs, say, for example, in manufacturing, in most areas, manufacturing pays more than the average job. So you're losing jobs um, in a sector that pays a lot. Those individuals then don't spend as much in the region, and that ripples into further decline in the retail area. You start to see it in housing and in, um, in the schools with uh, general decline. And to make it even more difficult, and this really, I think, is, hopefully will give you a sense of why uh, is the unemployment rate so high in the Danville, West Piedmont area and so low in Northern Virginia, but consistently high in the West Piedmont area. And that is, so we lose 10,000 jobs in broad woven fabric mills. Um, that's an industry under textiles, textiles being under manufacturing. And with those 10,000 jobs lost, here are the top 10 um, occupations. Textile winding, twisting, and drawing out machine centers, about 1,200. Textile knitting and we weaving machine centers, about 1,100. And if you go down the list, just about every one of those jobs is a textile-related job. Those jobs are not easily transferable into another industry. Um, t in fact, just about one of them that is, it's the testers and sorters, is transferable to many different industries. Um, but for the most part, um, these individuals, when they lose their jobs, the textile industry and apparel industry overall is in decline. It's not growing anywhere. And so their only choice, if they want to stay in the region, is to find alternative occupations. Typically, there are no other manufacturing jobs, again, that they can go into. And so they end up taking lower level jobs, uh, maybe retail or customer service reps, whatever, that make a lot less money than uh, the manufacturing di jobs did. However, if you're an accountant and you're working for a bank, you lose your job, you can easily get a job in an insurance company or in a manufacturing firm. They're more easily transferable. So that the big issue, part of the long-term decline that we're seeing in, in some of the more rural areas is because they have skills that are not transferable to other, um, not easily transferable to other industries. And so from that perspective, as we economists often just talk about industries, we need to talk about occupations because it's the occupations within the industries that have transferable skills that can be moved between um, industries and that better explains why some regions are growing faster and why some regions continue to stall. So one of the paradigm shifts or a takeaway from this is that people are the magnet for replacing obsolete industries. So when you consider some place like Danville, bringing in industries that use those type of skills um, are very different than in Northern Virginia uh, where you have a more highly skilled population. Um, one of the questions that you may be asking here today is how do we close the gap between demand from businesses and, and the supply of workers that we have? And so what I'm going to do here is give you some information that might help you think through that later. But first, we need to look at the root cause. What's causing there to be a gap between the demand and, and supply of the type of workers and occupations and skills that we have? Churn, this thing that uh, we economists call creative destruction. You have industries that are created and they destroy other industries. It's not a bad thing. It, it leads to greater productivity. For example, refrigerators destroy the um, ice, to some degree, the ice industry where um, people would take ice to everyone's house. Um, and you have the um, cell phones now uh, that are really putting an end to landlines as we know them. So um, we continue to see this creative destruction going on in our economy. 
Also, we've seen most of the high-skilled jobs going offshore, the low-skilled jobs going offshore, which means that we have high-skilled jobs remaining, and there tends to be that gap that Andy uh, alluded to between the two, which leads to higher wages in the high-skilled area. Also, there's a lack of easy to understand and integrated workforce planning information. That is, all the information is out there, but it probably takes a week sometimes to pull enough information together to make a decision. And then culture doesn't foster long, uh, lifelong learning in many cases, so that's, that's another area that causes these gaps to occur. And a lack of policies to drive change is needed to reduce the gaps, and I'll get into that one uh, toward the end here. But here's a question for you. What industry is this? And just shout out answers. In blue, I'm showing you employment growth. And if some of you have seen this, don't shout out the answer. Um, you're seeing employment growing um, from 15 to 40,000 jobs in Virginia over a 20-year period. Anyone want to guess what that is? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Technology. Technology. Medical. Medical. Those are all good ones. It's apparel. I tricked you because I didn't tell you what year we were looking at. We were looking at the 1940s through the 1970s. <laughs> the apparel industry was a huge driver of growth in the Virginia economy during the 1940s. And then in 1977, when it started going offshore, um, it started to decline and it continues to. Um, the point of this chart is that industries will change and even though we think that technology is a strong industry today, there are parts of technology that won't be as we look to the future. So we need to have transferable skills um, as we go forward. Um, here now, the root causes, again, this same slide. The first two things are not controllable. We can't control creative destruction or that in, uh, some industries are going offshore. But we can control getting the information on the workforce so that we could plan. Uh, to some degree, we can at least encourage people to foster lifelong earning. And third, um, the policies, we can create policies to close those gaps. So I'm going to address number one and number um, three in a couple more slides here. Um, I'm an economist, and so I kind of have to put these slides in every once in a while. This is your Econ 101 stuff. Information is critical to the effective functioning of markets. Who would go, go out today and spend $50,000 in an investment that you just heard about a day ago. Um, but you have students all the time going into careers and spending $50,000 of their money or their parents' money to um, go after a career, a four, five, six year time period that they really hadn't determined whether they'll be able to find a job once they've ended. So um, basically, here one of the Fed economists I'm quoting, a core principle of economics is that markets are more competitive and therefore more efficient when accurate information is available to both consumers and suppliers. If consumers are well informed, they are in a better position to make decisions that are in their best interest. So the bottom line here is that from my perspective, information will enhance workforce alignment, regional growth, and that we need policies to, um, to support that. Uh, so one, a couple of strategies that I'll give you here. One potential strategies, strategy is to provide more information so that students and displaced workers can identify the demand occupations in their region and that higher education can allocate resources to curriculum that's in demand. So here I have some national data for you, but we have this information at the state level and at the metropolitan level, and I'm just giving the example of advertising in terms of the curriculum. So we had 5,689 people awarded a degree last year in advertising. And guess what the total demand was for the nation? The total demand for people in advertising was 2,300. And that number is not low because of the recession. That's an average 10-year demand. So we had 5,000 kids go after a degree. And down here below, these are a couple of occupations they may go into. And again, these numbers add up to uh, 2,300 in terms of the demand. So if these 5,000 students knew that the demand was so little, would they have considered another occupation, an occupation that maybe would have been in greater demand? And given this information, if a lot of students are wanting to take advertising all of a sudden because we have CSI advertising or something, I don't know, on TV, then 
w would it make sense for schools to be adding that curriculum just because there's demand from the students to take it? Or should we use this kind of information to inform our decisions? So that's one way, uh, one potential strategy to close those gaps. Give information to the people making decisions. Give information to the people that are providing the classes. Uh, if you don't, we end up with underemployment. And underemployment is when you get a degree and you don't end up using your skill level. So here we have a guy at the drive through asking the, the person if they'd like a, uh, his master's thesis along with the food that he's getting. That, that's underemployment. Okay, alignment between firms and regional workforce is needed to remain competitive. Another Fed governor said that few tools in the economic development arsenal as, are as powerful as those that successfully match workers and jobs. And so here's an example, I think, in our state where that has happened and also where, in giving you this example, you'll see that we do have the data to be able to identify um, supply and demand. So there was a firm um, looking uh, to increase by about 500 people, engine, turbine, and power transmission equipment manufacturing, and they settled in the Crater William, uh, workforce area, which is Hopewell, Petersburg. And that firm, um, we can look at the uh, information in terms of, okay, if they have 500 workers, they're going to need 58 team assemblers, 43 machinists, engineers, etc. Then we could look at the Petersburg area and see if, in fact, they do have that inventory of workers. We can also look at things like what sort of education levels are needed uh, with this firm um, if they do come to the uh, Virginia area. And here, again, this engine uh, equipment manufacturing firm uh, would need probably about 19.3% of their workforce a college degree, about 4.4% with associate's degree. And then when we look at that particular area that they were considering, we see that about 18% or 19% had a, a bachelor's degree and higher. So if economic development's goal in that region is to wage, raise the uh, wage levels, to raise the, earn, uh, the um, degree levels of their population, then bringing in this firm is going to bring them um, closer to that goal. And in fact, um, that did happen. And if you all remember when Governor Kane announced that 500 jobs um, coming to Prince George County, Rolls-Royce, he said their decision uh, to locate operations here is a strong affirmation of the talent and professionalism of our educated, high-tech workforce in Virginia that can compete globally. So clearly, workforce, again, is important in bringing firms, new firms, into regions, and regions that are growing at a slower rate, such as um, Prince uh, George County, Petersburg area. Policy implications. Some things for maybe you to think about um, this afternoon. Are Virginia's businesses' needs for talent sufficiently integrated into higher education planning and workforce development? Um, that is, do, does higher education and do training providers know what the business needs are? Uh, another question, what policies foster stronger alignment between degree focus and job creation? Should the state invest in degrees that are not in demand where there is an oversupply of talent? Um, that is, how, much, how important is it for um, all the courses that are available to be what the students want, want versus what the businesses want, or is there some uh, ground in between? Should students be more informed before declaring majors if they want to live and work in Virginia? Uh, some students may find, given the uh, careers that they um, are choosing, they may not be able to live in Virginia. That there are more opportunities for them, say, on the uh, West Coast or in some other areas. But it would be good for them to know before they go and start down that four-year path whether or not the demand is there for the skill that they will have. And when should higher education align curriculum to student preferences and why? So um, in winding down here, I'm going to show you a couple more slides on STEM and then sort of transfer over back to Andy with a question for him, linking this back to the K through 12. But STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, is a big initiative around the country and in many um, states. And here you could kind of see why. I'm showing you Virginia and employment and STEM, um, STEM industries. And then I'm showing you the dotted line is a forecast. So STEM industries, employment, is expected to grow 2.9% a year. 
Remember, Virginia employment growing 1.7% a year, much faster than uh, growth overall in other industries. And when you look at annual average wages, notice that STEM industries pay very well. STEM industries, on average, in Virginia pay $100,000 compared to about uh, $50,000 in all industries in Virginia. And then when we look at the specific industries, now here uh, in this first column, we're looking at some um, specific individual industries that are considered STEM. And notice that a lot of them have computer in it, computer uh, systems designs. And here we see data processing, software publishers. Uh, we also see um, technical consulting services, engineering, architecture, R&D. Notice the wages are fairly high. And here you're seeing the employment change over the last year and um, the replacement demand being those people retiring, so we're going to have to uh, get new students in or new workers in to, uh, to replace them, and then total employment growth. And notice some fairly fast growth rates. Overall, again, 2.9%. Then, again, that was the industry level. Now let's look at the occupations. So this gives us an idea of the skills that the STEM people have to have. And notice we've got software developers, computer support, another computer, software, computer, network. All of them are computer related until we get to the last two, which are sales and then technical and scientific, I'm sorry, sales and then civil engineers. And now on this next page, I'm going to show you the curriculum. And that is this past year in Virginia, how many people did we graduate in the computer area? And here's the change in the awards from a year ago. Notice computer. 1,100, on the previous page, you saw about four or 5,000 jobs needed per year that were computer related. Here, we're seeing about 1,000 that are graduating, and somewhat disconcerting, it's down 1,000 from the previous year. Uh, here's information science, and again, 800. It's down a bit from the previous year. And computer software engineering, it's down uh, from the previous year. So um, STEM, although in demand, it looks like uh, from the perspective of the supply side, we're not seeing as many students going into that area. And then finally, aligning this and bringing it down to the high school level. And so after we have occupations, then we could look at the attributes and the knowledge within those occupations. And when we do that, so we took all of the occupations in Virginia and we sort of teased out the type of attributes they have. And so what this chart is saying is that 80% of all um, occupations in Virginia have a strong, um, strong piece of English language in it. That is, that's, that's important within that job. That's literacy. literacy. Uh, second, you see customer and personal service is very strong within all occupations, and I would call that soft skills. Um, and then third is math is very strong. So if we look down this line, um, basically you see all the skills that are important in the jobs uh, these skills that could be transferred down to the high school level. We look at other places within Virginia, and they change a bit, but you can see, for the most part, it's the same list, although the percentages you might have noticed have changed. When we go to Danville, here again, English language, important, but at the end, mechanical and uh, production and processing is showing up uh, more so than it does in some of the other um, uh, regions around the state. So in concluding then, I think I want to toss this back to Andy and ask him, STEM is very important. STEM is important in our growth. Uh, and as a state among the states that we compete with and as in globally, how is K through 12 in Virginia doing with regard to STEM? When students go out to find a job, are they ready after graduating? Sure. Thank you.